Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I am Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Stuart McPherson films the world one mountain at a time. Bright Sparks research possum water and artificial blood vessels. But first up, here's the news. Recycling cells win a Nobel Prize. The 2016 Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology goes to Yoshinari Osumi in Japan for locating the genes that regulate the cellular self-eating process known as autophagy and explaining how they work. Cells extract protein and other nutrients from dead cells before flushing the waste to be excreted. Disruptions to this mechanism contribute to many illnesses such as Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, age dementia, and cancer. The 1974 Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology was awarded for discovering in the 1960s that the cell could destroy its own contents by enclosing it in membranes, forming sac-like vesicles that were transported to a recycling compartment called the lysosome for degradation. The 2004 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for the discovery in the 1980s of how basic proteins were broken down in autophagy. Building on this work in the early 1990s, Yoshinari Osumi used baker's yeast to identify genes essential for autophagy. He then went on to find the underlying mechanisms for autophagy in yeast and showed that the same kind of machinery is used in human cells. The process is used in the adaptation of cells to starvation and the response to infection. Mutations in the autophagy genes are involved in several conditions, including cancer and neurological disease. New drugs may be inspired by our understanding of cells' self-eating processes. Wi-Fi emotions. MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory have announced the latest development of an ongoing project to extract information from the return path of Wi-Fi radio signals. The radio waves pass through and bounce off people to reveal information about them, even through walls. The latest version, EQ Radio, can read the emotions of strangers with 70% accuracy and people who've been calibrated with 87% accuracy by measuring their breathing and heart rate. They can tell at a distance whether you're happy, angry, excited or sad. In 2013, the MIT team were able to detect the motion of humans using Wi-Fi, even on the other side of the wall. Then they refined their system so they could make out gestures and body movements. With even more refinements, they're able to measure the change in volume of your lungs to work out how fast you're breathing and the speed your heart is beating. Wi-Fi heart rate monitoring is claimed to be as accurate as medical electrocardiogram ECGs wired to your chest. The team hope to be able to monitor when elderly people in care have fallen or when their heart falters. Smart homes that respond to your mood or help you shift your mood to a better one. They expect to sell the device to marketers and movie producers to better measure your reactions in focus groups. They also see more invasive direct marketing where advertisers are better able to manipulate you into buying their wares based on their knowledge of your mood. And of course, the police would love to be able to read the emotions of people they're questioning, or at security points like airports, and perhaps to screen people en masse. Not only are there privacy and consent issues for a remote, invisible way to read people, but when the authorities use such devices, they're inevitably undertrained in how to read them and overtrust what the machines tell them. This can result in all kinds of miscarriages of justice, which is one of the reasons that polygraph lie detector tests are not admissible in court. If the police are questioning you, you're likely to be excited or anxious because of the possibility of being wrongly accused or because the situation's so unusual. 
or you could be sick, or even calm and the machines made an error. Of course, since it's based on Wi-Fi, the software may end up as an app on everybody's phones. Won't that be fun? You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And now part two of Save the Carnivorous Plants. Stuart McPherson is a naturalist, writer and filmmaker. He's climbed 300 mountains to research 25 books on carnivorous plants. I met up with Stuart in a park by the water in Piermont and continued the interview by asking him about his Kickstarter project to make some films. Yes, I've done a couple. So I did, I did a, a, ser- a TV series called Britain's Treasure Islands looking at the UK overseas territories and I ran a Kickstarter project to make 42 short films that showcased the incredible wildlife of all these different overseas territories. So the territories are islands that are scattered all over the globe that remain under UK sovereignty through their own wish. They're not colonies, they're the opposite. They, they choose to remain under UK sovereignty, like the Falklands or Gibraltar and, and so forth. And anyway, I went to them all over four years and filmed a TV series and had load, hundreds of hours of footage left over. And these islands are very little known, so I thought well, it would be nice to, to make a resource totally free for everyone to watch. So we, we ran a Kickstarter project and in the end made 42 short films that are online and you can watch them completely free of charge. Just go to britainstreasureislands.com. Britain's B-R-T-I-A-N-S without an apostrophe, treasureislands.com. And they're all there, you can watch them. They're called these mini documentaries. I've just launched another one which is really close to my heart. I grew up, obviously, as you might be able to tell, in England, had had a miniature zoo in my bedroom. I had (laughs) animals. I had wonderful, about 50 species of of stick and leaf insects, phasmids. I had chameleons, giant millipedes, tarantulas, jewel beetles. Honestly, you name it. I had a literally little menagerie, and I was absolutely... This was my life looking after these creatures and caring for them, and I absolutely loved them. And it it absolutely was fundamental in driving my personal passion for for natural history. And today you see so many kids that just don't care about nature, and so many kids that just care about computers or TV. And I'm not in any way saying that's a bad thing. It's great to be passionate about any subject, but equally, never has interest and care in natural history have been needed more than now uh, but equally never is it at a lower level I think I think that's true to say amongst younger generations than than today so I set up a new Kickstarter project that basically aims to just help showcase a wonderful range of small animals like stick insects that young people can keep at home of course you know I don't in any way want to promote them caring for them unethically there's kind of three golden rules to caring for, for animals, which is of course never ever ever get animals from the wild or, or buy them from people that collect them from the wild. Only look after animals and care for animals that you can create a suitable environment and habitat for, because otherwise they'll just simply die. And of course always, uh, always give the right amount of care and attention that those animals need. But providing those three criteria can be met, I think it's a wonderful way to get young people interested in nature. For example, yes, stick insects, stick and leaf insects, you know, can be kept so easily at home. And there's such a bewildering array that can be kept that are amazing. And it's funny, all kids are born with an inherent passion and and awe, which is lost along the way to adulthood. Uh, Just think, I mean, everyone is can remember their first spider web or you know spider web glistening with dew in the morning or anything a flower opening or anything like that or seeing tadpoles or the metamorphosis of a butterfly and yeah you kind of lose that as you grow up particularly by guess becoming surly teenagers and so forth and my my current kickstarter project is to try and get people connected to that again and and just show them show them this wonderful range of of little small animals that they can keep responsibly and ethically at home 
and hopefully drive that passion and, and help nurture the next generation of naturalists and, and conservationists. And where should they find it? What's it called? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, if, if they want to see more about it, it's called Weird and Wonderful Pets. If you just go to kickstarter.com, just type in at the top Weird and Wonderful Pets and it'll come up. <laughs> it runs for about another month, it ends at the end of October and the idea is basically we're trying to make a series of again totally free online films that hopefully will touch millions and millions of young lives. The idea is that we, we create yeah, a series of short films. I've been really lucky, I've got an unbelievable team assembled including quite literally one of the best wildlife film producers, like it, literally one of the producers that, that helped make many of those big BBC um, David Attenborough series is, and likewise a cameraman that equally filmed for, for those for many of those big David Attenborough series is. both of them really believe in this really 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 want to help encourage the next generation and are, are putting in their time and their resources and their energy at virtually nothing they're, they're charging me like a quarter of the normal rate which is unbelievably generous so the idea if it's successful is to, to then make these films in November December and um, then release them early 2017 and get them out to a really wide audience and hopefully, yeah, inspire millions of kids around the world. I guess, uh, more than anything, I just really hope anyone with an interest in nature pursues it. It's so easy not to these days with so much technology and stuff around, but there's so much out there to go and see. Not even, I don't necessarily mean travel, I mean literally in your back garden. And it doesn't matter which country you're in. It, you can literally be in any country in the world. So I guess my last, my last point is just if you have any interest in nature at all, just never give up and follow it. Drive that passion forward. Or if you're a parent and your kids show interest, drive that forward in any way you can because never has it been more important than now. Well, Stuart McPherson, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. That was part two of Stuart McPherson talking about his career as a naturalist, writer and filmmaker. Check the website for links to Stuart's films, photos and books from Redfern Publications. And now, some bright spark challenges. Sarah Brooker from Science in Public created Fresh Science to encourage early career scientists to find the story in their science and get it out to the public. The Bright Spark Challenge is for these scientists to explain their research in the 45 seconds it takes a sparkler to burn down. The talks were held on the upstairs stage of the noisy pub, The Three Wise Monkeys in Sydney. Edward Waters, come on up to the stage. Edward is from the University of Notre Dame here in Sydney. So I'm a mathematician, but I'm terrified of getting gastro. So I started my research by wanting to know, how can I avoid this? Turns out, if it's kind of a bug that we get from animals, and specifically I was interested in possums, I can't do crap. Because if their crap gets into rainwater, and I drink it, and my family drinks it, we all get sick. What my mathematical model showed is that if animals are so infected, like possums are, then they can drive foodborne disease in the human population even if we don't give it to each other, which means there's really nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. There's nothing we can do um, in terms of stopping us getting it from each other because the force of infection, which is a term we use from the animal population, is so high. That's really what drives infection in humans and anything we do to try and stop us passing it to each other is going to have a negligible effect. So just give in. <laughs> so what should we be targeting instead? So you've got to target the source, which is the animal population, or the pathway by which the animal is spread to us. So in this case, rainwater is something I was looking at. And look, realistically, in somewhere like Sydney, if you've got a rainwater tank and you're watering your garden or whatever, but you're not actually drinking that and you're doing some sort of treatment, the risk is not that bad. It's more an issue in rural areas. Something like 60 to 70% of indigenous children are infected with parasites that result in failure to thrive and other nutrition and those kind of issues. 
Um, in those situations, you want to be either targeting the animal host directly and prohibiting access to the areas that it can contaminate, um, possibly doing things like treating with antibiotics. Um, some treat, some water treatment, but there are protozoan pathogens which aren't very responsive, so you know, you can irradiation and things which are not really feasible. So target the animal first, if possible, and then the contamination pathway. Yeah. We're in the middle of a gastro outbreak here in Sydney at the moment, actually. Um, so although you said that's probably not possible because we're not drinking our rainwater that much here. If you go out bush, what sort of fraction of gastro infections are likely to be animal related? So have you done the maths to know that when you go out bush, what proportion of gastro is actually animal related? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, actually. So intuitively, so with you... You know, with animals, you're looking at protozoa, which are basically somewhere between animals and plants. So they have, they move, but some of them have chloroplasts. Um, they have really weird life cycles. Um, or bacteria. Whereas with the gastro outbreak in Sydney, you're looking at things more like maybe norovirus and so on, so the viral pathogen. And traditionally, um, we kind of thought that viruses are much more transmissible. In actuality, we're now learning, and particularly in rural areas, um, most of what you see is protozoan and bacterial. So, you know, it could be the vast majority um, in rural areas is coming from animals. The problem always comes the fact that for every case that you see at a doctor or at a hospital and you actually identify the pathogen, there are a hundred to several hundred cases in the community that never get treated. And that's kind of the big statistical problem in definitively answering that question. Statistical problem, that sounds like mathematicians to the rescue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Pretty you, much. Edward. Well done. That was Edward Waters from the University of Notre Dame asking, Possums, furry friend or filthy foe? Yelena, come up to the stage. Yelena is from the University of New South Wales. And there's your microphone and here is your implement for tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Yelena and I'm a biomedical engineer. And as biomedical engineers, we're getting really good at designing fissures in the lab. So you can make artificial skin, artificial heart, artificial uh, muscle equivalents. But these tissues can only be really, really small and survive for very short periods of time in the petri dish because they don't have a blood supply or vasculature. And so my research is trying to engineer these blood vessels into <coughs> artificial tissues. And I do this by designing new biomaterials that promote uh, vascular ingrowth in bioengineered tissues and organs. Yeah, we need 45 seconds if you can win them over in 30. Well done. So you're creating blood vessels? And what are you making them out of? So that's correct. I'm creating blood vessels by designing biomaterials out of silk. So I use um, Bombix Mori silk cocoons to make biomaterials. And I You're using what? Bombix Mori is the type of silkworm. It's a silkworm. It's a silkworm. Thank worm. you. That's a fancy name for a silkworm. It, it's the species. Thing. Okay. <laughs> um, and I add um, proteins and molecules that will that are found in the human body that mimic the human vasculature in order to promote blood vessel ingrowth into my material. Question at the back. Thank you. Um, so I, I could be wrong, but my understanding is that silk is non-resorbable. Does that pose a problem for your, for your newly engineered structures? The question is, silk is non-absorbable, so is that a problem for you? So that's a great question, actually, and it's a common misunderstanding about silk. So silk sutures are non-resorbable, and that's because <coughs> so silk sutures are commonly used, or used to be commonly used, um, as a suture. And they're not resorbable because of the coating on them, the vascular coating on them. Whereas the silk material is actually resorbable in the body, and we can actually tailor the degradation of silk to last in the body between days and years, depending on the application. A 
question in the middle. Yes, Robert. So, um, when you make, when you coat the silk to make the blood vessels grow into it, uh, do you have control over what sort of blood vessels you get, from tiny capillaries up to uh, bigger vessels that you can actually climb in? Yeah, how big have you made them? So, you have a little bit of control, but not a huge amount. So initially, mostly, it's small capillaries. And eventually these do connect to bigger vessels, but we don't have anything in the scale of giant arteries or things. But the idea behind these is just enough vasculature to allow these tissues to survive when they're implanted in the body. Because what happens now is you implant them in the body, they don't survive, the cells are dying in the middle of the tissue because they don't have oxygen and nutrients, and then that causes uh, an inflammatory response and all kinds of problems downstream. So how big have you grown a, a blood vessel? What's so the longest you've grown so far? We've gone gone to tissues that are about that thick, which is... So you've grown a blood vessel four, down into the thickness? Yep, okay. about four or five centimeters, whereas the limit of passive diffusion without vasculature is about a millimeter or less. So what sort of tissue, what were you growing that into? What sort of organ were you thinking of? So we do this, my work is a lot of skin and muscle, skeletal muscle. Yeah but um, the principles are translatable to most species. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? How far are we from this being something that we can use clinically, say mm -hmm. for massive trauma patients? So, the actual bioengineered tissues are being used clinically um, for skin and bladder mostly, so for very thin tissues. And we're probably a few decades from large organs and tissues being used more clinically. At the moment, one of the biggest problems is the vasculature, the other one is cost. Can you join me in thanking Yelena? Thank you. That was Yelena Arjak Kovacina from the University of New South Wales talking about her research into blood supply, the missing piece of the bioartificial organ puzzle. Thanks to Sarah Brooker and Neil Byrne of Science in Public for permission to broadcast the Fresh Science Bright Spark Challenge. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, standing ovations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the Community Radio Network, including 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about carnivorous plants and Stuart McPherson's adventures. If you enjoyed the show, then explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on www.diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. 
knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.